Hello everyone, and welcome to another tutorial from BlenderCookie.com. My name is Jonathan Williamson, and today we're going to recreate this kind of 3D speaker iPhone-like icon that I created the other day. This was a fun little project that I just did in some spare time uh, when I was just wanting to experiment with a few things in Blender and Cycles. And this was a really fun little project because it involved a couple of different things that uh, A, used Cycles, B covered modeling, which I love, and it also used compositing to get some subtle extra effects to bring it all together. So it was a really fun little project and had a couple of people ask for a tutorial on it, so here you are. And what we're going to be doing in this is we're first going to model it, including this backplate, the actual speaker portion here, the LED right in here. Then we're going to go in and we're going to render it in cycles by creating several different node materials, including the wood texture here, the metal textures, uh, some ways to get this really nice reflective plastic material here in the back without being uh, just a basic glossy. And then also how to finally go in and composite this entire thing, including this little glare here uh, to help really make it look like this light is actually turned on and to get the final effect. So let me first go ahead and take you through this scene and kind of how some of it's constructed. First of all, uh, you can see the, the actual model right here. So this is the, the model itself. It's fairly simple. Basically, we've got a tube here. We've got two different pieces of the the mesh grid or the uh, the wire mesh. Then we've got the speaker behind it. We've got the LED right up here, and then finally we have the actual backplate and then the background plane as well. And then these two meshes that you see are actually lights. So we have a key light here that's just white. Uh, that's help just illuminating the entire scene and kind of casting some of the main shadows right down here. And then finally we have a blue tinted light which helps kind of give the entire ambience to the image and helps counter this really bright red bright red slash yellow glow right here so that we get a nice kind of color balance in the scene. Finally, everything is taken into, into the compositor where I've brought in basically a, a simple mask right here for the LED so we've got a little more control over it. I've got the actual uh, render right here and a couple of things. You know, first I'm actually blurring the LED just a little bit because this actual one is actually very sharp, but we'll look at that here in just a little bit. And so these are the nodes, uh, these ones here are the ones that control the blur to make this look a little softer and illuminated. And then these ones right in here control the actual glow that you see right there, followed by the actual final composite. So let's get started and recreate this directly from scratch. So I'm just going to load up a brand new file. I'm going to hit 1 and 5 to switch into front view. And then I'm going to start by creating the actual speaker box. The speaker box is really, really simple, and that is the, the background behind the speaker. So I'm just going to hit Shift A, add in a plane, and then hit Tab to go right into edit mode and hit R, X, and 90 to just rotate that around the X axis. I'm next going to go ahead and create the rounded corners on this, you know, kind of like this. And it's actually a lot easier to do than you might think. You know, you could go ahead and do a spin command and spin it around that corner. You could manually do it, or you could do it out of like a half circle. Or you could simply go to the modifier panel, hit tab to leave edit mode first, add in a subsurf modifier, increase the resolution to say 3, and then go back into edit mode, select everything, hit W, subdivide, and maybe just subdivide it twice, then leave us with a nice straight edge right here, followed by a nice rounded corner. If you don't want it quite so rounded, you could go ahead and subdivide it one more time. Uh, and in fact, I think maybe I'll do that. There we go. It gets a nice rounded corner on there. And this means that I can just keep this incredibly simple, just like that. And to create the actual box, I might just hit E to extrude, take this straight back along the Y axis, maybe to right about there. I could go ahead and delete this face, so I'll just hit X, delete those faces, and then maybe to smooth out this corner, you know, I'd really like this just to be a straight edge up to here, a straight edge up to there, and this to be a nice angled edge, something like that, so it looks like a nice kind of clean bevel on that shape. Well, the way that I would do that is first is go and add another edge loop, maybe slide it all the way over to there, and then back over just so I can position it exactly on that grid increment, just because I'm particular. Then I'll do the same thing right there, or excuse me, actually, rather than doing it right there, uh, we're going to do that a little bit simpler. Uh, instead, I'm going to go ahead and select this entire front piece, hit 1 to go into front view, and then I'm just going to hit E to extrude, which gives me an extra piece right here. 
Uh, and when you hit E to extrude, you're actually going to be put into grab mode like this. But I don't actually want to move that out, so I'm just going to right click to cancel that, which still leaves me with the extrusion, but I just cancel the movement. And then I can just scale this in. I'll scale it in one unit, uh, right there, one unit like that, which gives me a nice even spacing for this, this increment, uh, which I like. And then on this, I can actually go ahead and just take this edge loop, and maybe I will just pull it all the way back one unit, then maybe hit Control E and edge slide, bring it down just the littlest bit, maybe add in another edge loop by hitting Control R, which automatically puts me into edge slide mode, which I'll just slide it right down to there, which then gives me a really nice bevel on there. Now this bevel is maybe a little too strong, so if I wanted to undo that, or to kind of soften up that bevel, I might go ahead and delete the interior edge loops first by selecting them, which I can do with Alt right click, then hit X and delete the edge loop, and then I can maybe just go ahead and scale this up, you know, just a little bit like that, so it's a little bit less extreme, and then I can add in those edge loops, maybe like that, and like that. Maybe I'll select everything, W and Shade Smooth, and I've got a nice sharp corner. So very cool. You can do that, you know, again, any number of ways, and as sharp or as little sharp as you want. I might maybe go ahead and bring these up just a little further. There we go, just so it kind of flattens out that edge a little more. Cool, I like that. Well, now let's go ahead and we'll turn on optimal display for this so that it's a little cleaner in the viewport. And I'm now gonna hit Shift A, add in a mesh and a circle. On the circle, uh, let's go ahead and we'll set the vertex count to 12. We really don't need too many in here. We wanna keep it fairly simple and then we can let the subsurf modifier do some of the work for us. To make this fit right along this profile, I wanna go ahead and just set this to, or rotate it 90 degrees around the x-axis. So I'll just hit R, X, type in 90 degrees, and now it's sitting perfectly flat on that surface. So I can just scale this down, maybe to, uh, we'll just do say right about there, and just something that feels about right. And then I can maybe go ahead and extrude this out along the y-axis, maybe extrude out again, plus scale in, which will create another nice kind of beveled edge right there. Then maybe I'll extrude it in again. And maybe one more time. Again, creating a little bit of a beveled edge. And I think that ought to be pretty good for the, the main outside frame. So let's select everything, hit W and Shade Smooth. You can see we're getting these black, nasty black areas right in here. So let's go ahead and hit Control N to recalculate those normals. And then we'll go ahead and add in a subsurf modifier. Maybe increase the resolution to two so it's nice and smooth maybe turn on optimal display. All right, now I wanna create this nice beveled edge again, so maybe I'll select these. I could either add in another edge loop here, or since this is a simp simple edge, I can go ahead and just crease this by hitting Shift E and one, which will crease that up, and maybe I can do the same thing right there. And the, so that's just Shift E followed by one, or between zero and one, or you can also see the mean crease right here. And that works pretty well for creasing things like this. Um, you will notice though that even though this is a sharp edge, we're getting some rounding right here. And so if you're going to use the creasing rather than perimeter edge loops, I encourage you actually to use a combination of both. As you can see, if I add another edge loop here and slide it up, you'll see how that shading immediately improves with just that little bit of extra. So if I slide that up to there and maybe add another one in right there, then I get a really nice clean result. I can also increase the resolution to three maybe on the subsurf modifier so I don't see quite so many of the edges along that side. So then if we do the same thing then on this side, set the creasing to one, followed by adding another edge loop in just like that, then we get a really nice clean result. Okay, let's go ahead and punch a hole in this, which is gonna be pretty easy to do. Basically all I wanna do is grab all of these interior vertices. I'm gonna hit X, delete those vertices. Then I basically wanna take this and scale it down to then fit inside this circle in a circular shape such that you don't see any of the insides. Well, you know, I could maybe go and hit W and smooth a few times, kind of get a circular shape, or I could go ahead and use the loop tools, which is an add-on that is included with Blender 2.6 on. I, I'm using 2.61 right now since that's the latest, but I think loop tools has actually been included since maybe 2.58 maybe. Uh, but if you just go to the mesh tools, you can see loop tools right here. You just enable that 
And then inside edit mode, if you hit W, loop tools, and circle in this case, it will convert that to a perfect circle, or so we wanted it to be. You can see that something has gone awry here and it's not quite working. So A, we can double check some of these settings to see kind of what's going on. And we can see that, well, that doesn't change anything. So let's step back for a second. And I'm going to take a guess, and I could be wrong, that this is not converting into a nice circle because we have normals going in every which way. If we look at this, we can see actually the normals are perfectly fine. Um, well, not actually sure why that didn't work. You can see that that definitely did not want to work. Uh, let's, if we take a look at the vertex normals, we can see that they're all correct. Huh, well, very weird. Uh, so much for my wonderful display of loop tools. Uh, they are actually really, really awesome and generally work very well. But in this case, we're going to use a different method, which is the two sphere method. The two sphere tool basically allows you to take any mesh, such as this one, and make it into a ball. Well, cool, but not what we want for this. But if we do this loop, since this loop is essentially 2D in the sense that it follows a dis single uh, line, if we hit Alt-Shift-S and do two sphere and type in one, that will make it into a perfect circle. Very, very cool. However, we actually don't want to do this just yet because we need to think ahead as to far as where what we need our mesh to actually do. And you may remember that I had a little LED right up here, which means I need to cut in a little circle in here, which also means that I really want a nice regular mesh all the way around that little circle in order to get nice clean geometry. Um, this falls into the topology category of knowing what you want to do with your topology. But basically what we want to do is we want to have one edge or basically we want um, a set of edge loops all the way around here like this. And then one on this side like this. And so really all we need to do is if we go in here and we select uh, this edge loop, hit control plus to add to the selection and then select each one of these little corner vertices and just hit E to extrude, right click, and then S to scale down, that will leave us with a perfect square right there where we can put in that little LED. Then we could go ahead and select this and scale it down just a little bit, and then we'll hit Alt, whoops, get back there, Alt, Shift, S, type in one, and that gives us a perfect circle around there, which just means on this loop, we can maybe take these ones um, minus the the corners here so i'll just deselect those corners and then again i can hit alt shift s maybe bring those out just a little scale them out just a little bit and that will give me a nice kind of even mesh where this is a perfect circle this is kind of a half circle but i've left these vertices perfectly intact such that i can go right in select this square here hit i or excuse me um just rather than i i'll just hit e to extrude right click scale this in just a little bit to create that inset and then I can just go and hit E to extrude this in take it in a little bit scale it in again to create that nice little angled bevel followed by perhaps uh, selecting this edge shift E and one to crease that nicely and I will then also uh, crease this loop as well shift E and one and that gives me a nice kind of sharp point on which I can then position my little LED something like that. Cool. All right, we can get rid of those grease pencil strokes. They're starting to get annoying, but that gives us a very nice clean mesh. Now, for warning, if this surface were curved, such as like, like that, or like, like, uh, like that, or, you know, you, you get the point. Uh, you would want to avoid this little point here because what this is, is a six sided pole where we have a single vertex with six edges extending from it. Uh, this is a not necessarily a topology no-no, but more of a topology concern depending on the mesh. Really what you would really like to have is to have this mesh coming down through here, or that face loop, where you have this face, or there we go. You have this series of faces, and then it would be good to have another series of faces going right through here, such that you have one pole here, where you have, say, five edges extending from it. 
or excuse me, three edges or four, whatever. Uh, and then you would have another one right in here with the edges extending out. That way you're not pinching in quite so many directions and you're giving this little kind of relief zone to keep your shading nice and smooth. But since this surface all through here is perfectly flat along the y-axis, it's not too much of a concern and we can get away with it at this point. But the key is that we know when we can get away with that and when we can't. So let's keep going. What I want to do now is to create the actual like speaker frame. So this will be the, you know, the inner circle here, the plastic outer circle, and then the don't or the, the cone between them kind of like that. So let's go and add in another circle. So we'll just do circle and we're going to go, you'll notice that I've, I, I don't know directly what causes this. Um, I believe it's a bug of some kind, but I haven't been able to report it yet because I haven't been able to narrow down exactly when it happens. But sometimes when you add an object in, in object mode in 2.61, you'll find that the options here are grayed out and you're unable to change them. If that happens um, until you know the bug is fixed or someone's able to report it and narrow it down to exactly what causes it, if you go into edit mode, delete all the vertices and then add in the circle, then you can add it just fine. So in this case, we'll turn it back down to 12 rotate around the x-axis 90 degrees and for this plastic piece we're first going to give it a nice little frame by coming out like this then we'll hit E to extrude scale it in and this then is where the the little plastic uh, piece which is going to be shaped kind of like that will come out like that so then I can hit E to extrude again scale it down to the inside of where I want that plastic piece to be say right about there and then I'm going to add in two edge loops by hitting control R, scroll up once on my scroll wheel, or if you uh, don't have a scroll wheel, you can use plus or minus on your number pad. And if you don't have a number pad, you can use the page up and page down keys, which on some laptops, if you don't have those, is going to be function up or down arrow. I can then just left click to position those, hit three to go to side view, pull it out along the Y axis, and that then will form the basic cap once I add in the subsurf modifier. But before that, though, let's go ahead and extrude this straight back to about there for the, the cone. And of course, I'm sure that my terminology is wrong. I am not a sound technician by any means whatsoever. And even basic terminology on things like speakers is beyond me. I only model. Uh, now I want to basically create the little dome cap right here. So I'm just going to extrude this out, say about there, scale it down. And then I will extrude it out again, scale it down, and then finally I'll extrude out just a little bit more and then hit W, merge at center to then give me a nice center point like that, which I can then bring in to make sure it's nice and smooth. Uh, and maybe I'll scale that out a little too sharp. Okay, I can now select everything, hit W and shade smooth, and I'll add in my subsurf modifier, say up to level two, and I can begin sharpening things up. So first on this piece, um, I might go ahead and just select all this, hit Y to split it apart, bring it out slightly along the Y axis, and then maybe scale up this circle just a little bit, followed by extruding it back along the Y axis to create a nice little dome piece. Maybe right now it's a little too thick, so let's select the entire piece. You can just hover over one of the vertices and hit L, and I'll hit S, Y, just flatten that out a bit, bring it back in. Okay, then on this piece, I'm going to again select this edge loop and hit V, which will rip that apart such that now this, this piece and this piece are separate. So if I just select this, I can maybe scale it up just a little bit or scale it down a little bit and then maybe hit E to extrude, take it back just a little bit so we see a little bit of an edge. And then I will do the same thing maybe right here all by scaling it out pull it out just a little bit and extrude in just a little bit. So that gives me those kind of three distinct pieces where maybe this is kind of the, the back frame. This then is this cap that holds it on. This is the cloth cone. And then this is the hard plastic cap. Okay. So then the next step is actually to go ahead and take all of this back along the Y axis such that there's a small gap right in there because I want to put start creating the actual mesh that is going to go over that. Although before I do that, I should take this back along the Y axis, maybe like that, followed by extruding it out just a little bit to form 
that thickness. Now you will notice that we get all these really nasty spots like this. Well, this is because of the creasing. In general, uh, when you're creasing things, you probably only want to do parallel edges and you don't want to have any perpendicular or crossing edges creased or you're going to get exactly this. So what we need to do is to get rid of these edges through here. Um, sounds like a tedious process, but really all we do, if we control tab, go into edge mode, and then if we alt shift or yeah, alt control click on those, we can actually select all of the edges in that face loop, which in this case are all of these like that, like that, and like that. And if we now just hit shift E and zero, that will, or excuse me, shift E and negative one, that will take those down to zero. So then we just need to do the same thing right here. So if we zoom in on this one, just alt control, that selects all of those. And we just hit uh, shift E, negative one, take those to zero. And then we have a very nice surface. So now we wanna do our mesh right across these. So the way that we create the mesh is a little complicated, but it's actually fairly simple once you get the hang of it. And to grab a drink of water. Um, basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a single little pattern that then we can tile multiple times. So basically we're gonna have a little piece like this and another little piece like this and then a little piece like that and a little piece, not well, that, that, yeah, that's a mess, but you kind of get the idea. So if we hit Shift A, we're gonna add in a little cube or actually it's a big cube at the moment, but if we tab you on edit mode, scale it way down, it's going to become a little cube. And let's just scale it way, way down to about the thickness that we want our uh, piece to be. We're then going to move it over along the x-axis and go and hit shift S and selection to grid, which will snap that right to the grid unit so it's nice and even. And let's hit control tab, go into face mode. I'm gonna select these two end faces and we wanna delete those because this is where the individual segments are going to attach. So we'll delete those, then we can go back into edit mode and maybe then pull this out, say, right to there. So that will be the length of one individual piece. This piece then, if we just add in, say, two edge loops, we can pull this up like that. Actually, we don't want to pull it up like that, we want to pull it out along the y-axis. And you want to pull about the width of the actual piece itself. Because then what we're going to do is basically we're going to tie all this such that it'll wrap around itself. So Let's go ahead and uh, add in an array modifier because this will start to kind of visualize what we're going to do with it. So we add in the array and basically what we want is we want to create kind of an S curve like this such that then another S curve could go like that. And you're just going to create this continuous pattern. So what we need to do is first we need to duplicate this, move it over along the X axis, maybe hit S, Y, negative one. And then if we hit Control Shift Tab to switch into vertex snapping, we can just snap right like that. So then we select everything, W and remove doubles. Okay, and so there you can see that's kind of going out. We can also add in a subsurf modifier right before the array so that it smooths it out a bit. And we can go ahead and hit uh, shading to be smooth and Control N to recalculate any normals. All right, so we have the first array. But let's actually duplicate that array modifier, and then we're going to set this to be constant offset, so it's always the exact same distance, and we're just going to set it along the z-axis. We'll just set it to uh, 0.1 at the moment, although this is probably going to be wrong. So there we have two different pieces, but really we need two pieces inside a single one. So let's shift D, move this up along the z-axis to 0.1, shift D, z, 0.1, there we go. And then we're going to hit S, Y, negative one to just flip it around. So if we control in, we can actually then set this to be 0.2 because it's duplicated now. And so now you can kind of see how we're gonna start getting that pattern. But if we were to say duplicate this now, rotate that 90 degrees, move it up like that, you can start to see exactly what we're starting to get. We get that kind of pattern. But a couple things, first of all, Let's delete this because you'll notice that our spacing is way too far apart. Instead of bringing these out the width of the actual piece, we only want to bring them out half the width because each one is going out one half and so then the adjacent ones um, will be exactly even. So if we do that, then we can see they'll come apart the same or the correct distance. You'll also notice that I accidentally pulled that one out. There we go. Okay. 
And you know, we can go ahead and extend this array now, any length that we want. But let's go ahead and first hit Alt D to duplicate this. Notice that I'm not doing Shift D because I want these to be linked. So if I rotate this 90 degrees around the axis, move this up to be right about, say, in, or actually, rotate 180, uh, move it down to maybe right about in there. We can see that that's going to start to work, although you also notice that it's not orientated correctly. But if we bring this down along the z-axis, then it will be. So what we want to do now is to use as few links as possible. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to add in a mirror modifier. So if I add in a mirror modifier, and actually, you know, let's still just stick with just the original. Whoops. Uh, Alt R, Alt G. There we go. Here's my original. So we're going to add in an array or a mirror modifier. So then it's mirrored like that. Um, which actually does not work because you'll see that this pattern does not con continue. So we actually can't do that. So let's actually remove that. My apologies. Uh, instead, what we will do is we're going to set the array modifier. Let's leave local view and just set this to be about where we want it to be. Like that. Let's go ahead and take this down to be GZ.05 negative. There we go. That looks like the, about the correct spacing. So if we set this back to 0.1, then that's nice and thick. Let's also uh, scale down the thickness of these. We can just select them by hitting Alt S or select them and hit Alt S and that will just kind of scale down along the normals, giving us a nice clean result. Although you notice these have become kind of a little wonky, so we just scale them to zero along the x-axis. Okay, and maybe that then needs to go down to say 0.05 and we can bring this down again a negative 0.025 like that to get our correct spacing. All right, let's Alt D to duplicate this. We'll rotate say 90 degrees, pull it up along the Z axis. To there, and that's not quite far enough because the pattern is not complete yet. I'm going to go into local. You can see that this can be a little finicky to set up just because you got to remember which way is which. Uh, oh, let's rotate 180 degrees around the z-axis because then that will basically be mirrored and should work well. If we then, let's see. What am I missing here? Okay, first off, let's. This is annoying me. So let's get. Let's enable merge and first and last, and merge first and last. And we're seeing some twisting there. So if we set this distance down to point zero zero one, then that will be far more accurate. So we duplicate this, rotate, and oops, rotate ninety. Sorry for the extra confusion here, but get this to be oh well, part of it, I believe, is because these patterns no longer line up correctly. These probably need to be spaced a little bit more. Let's all right, we're gonna make this a little easier. Let's go ahead and delete one of these. And then we're going to go ahead and duplicate this piece. We're going to take it down along the z-axis, say negative 0.05. Well, Alt D. Grab, pull it down to right there, which is negative 0 0.0. There we go, negative 0 0.025. Then in object mode, we're going to scale along the y-axis to negative 1, which then flips that around. And maybe I didn't want to flip that.
All right. This was very easy the first time that I did it. All right. Remove that. Remove that. We're going to duplicate this up half unit. We're going to SY negative one. And then we're going to shift D, rotate that 90 degrees. Move that over there. And we're going to rotate this 180. There you can see that that is working. Oh, so our problem uh, is really dumb on my part. It's that these spacings need to be exactly the same uh, between basically this and this. So that was my mistake. So let's select this. We're going to delete that. Select everything. Alt S. Scale them back up, say about to there. Then we will flatten these back out to zero these back out to zero then we can go ahead duplicate this rotate that around the y-axis 90 degrees pull it up move it over and you can see that that's actually working if we just go in we alt alt s scale that down flatten flatten and then we're going to select this one, then we'll select that one, hit Control L, and link the objects to the same data, so they're using the same mesh structure, and that then gives us a single actual link. So if we actually take that up like that, there we go. Okay, wow, that was way more complicated than it was supposed to be, but now I can actually go in, and I'm going to simply... Uh, join these together so I'll just join them so I have a single piece here and now I'm going to add in an array modifier which then I can just increase oops set that to one I can just increase the count I can then copy that array modifier and set it to be zero along the other axis whoops set it to say one and that's the wrong direction so we'll set that to zero and this one to one and currently you'll notice that these are not consistent where this is the x-axis but it's actually going down and this is the z-axis and it's going over so we just need to hit control a apply the rotation then we can delete those and now we can you know just increase this increase that and then if we hit slash we can go back into out of local view and we're just basically going to position this say right down like that somewhere we're going to scale this down until the Mesh is, mesh is about the size that we want, maybe right about in there. Move this out to its basic position right there. Okay, and don't worry about this little corner being cut out. And we're just going to increase the array until it covers in each direction, like that. And maybe we'll go one more just for safe measure. Pull it down kind of like that. Okay. That looks pretty good. Now we're going to go in, we're going to add in a lattice modifier, which if we now um, go ahead and hit Shift A, and I know I, I say go ahead a lot, I really need to work on that. Uh, but if we scale this up about like that, we can then go over to the lattice settings and we're gonna take the, the V down to one, so it's just basically a plane, and then we're going to increase the U to probably four, and the W to four, or actually, you know what, let's do five just for safe measure. So now if we take this lattice modifier, position it right about there with the, the grid, excuse me, the mesh, set the lattice as the object, we can now go in here, select the lattice modifier, and actually control the shape of this simply with the lattice. So now I can just pull this out and make it bulge down or bulge out to fit the shape that I want. And maybe I'll take the outsides, scale them in just a little bit. And I can take the just the outside corners, minus those corners, scale them in a little bit more, help give it just a little bit of a rounded shape. Flatten it out just a little bit more and then pull it out so it, or pull it back so it sits right inside that grid, and then that works very nicely. Maybe to keep this nice and shaped, I'll pull that point out 
just a little bit more so it keeps a nice kind of dome shape. And then what I want to do is I'm going to first off delete the subsurf modifier on this because the next thing that I'm about to do, oh, and I also need to add the merge on both the array modifiers so that these don't have seams in between them. You'll notice if I turn this off, then we actually get seams right in between some of the points. So we merge that. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take this, or we're going to add in a cylinder, a mesh and a cylinder. And some of you are going to be shocked because I'm actually going to use a Boolean, which I very, very seldom use Booleans simply because they're very, they tend to be very messy. But what I want to do is I just want to cut off these corners. And I don't really, you know, now that this is done, I'm actually going to just apply each one of these modifiers, which generally I wouldn't try to do, but with the, the Boolean, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Uh, and so I've got this now, and I'm going to add in a Boolean modifier. And I added in that cylinder because that was going to act as my Boolean object for which to cut away. And I made that cylinder roughly the same size as my, my cap right here. I didn't use this cap though, because it's far, far more complex than I needed to be. I just need to roughly cut off these corners. So going into local view on those, if I now add the Boolean modifier, set the object to be that new cylinder, it'll take just a little while. Which, by the way, if any of you are familiar with Booleans, you may also know that um, the a new version, or basically a new algorithm for Booleans, just got committed to the development version of Blender. You can see this is taking quite a while, and hopefully it's not going to crash on me. Ah, there we go. Uh, but basically, a new version of Booleans just got committed, which is much, much faster. This probably would have only taken a tenth of that time, and works a lot better too. And that just got committed to the development version. But now that that's done, I can just click apply and it'll take just a moment. And then as soon as that's done, again, this is really slow because Booleans in the current version are terrible. In the newer version, they're going to be much better. And then once BMesh happens, it's going to be even better. So now I can just delete that cylinder. I don't need it anymore. Leave uh, local view. And you can see that now my grid or my mesh is no longer visible from those sides. Cool. All right. Um, I do maybe need to pull it back just a little bit more right in there. Perfect. Now let's go ahead and create the basic LED. So I'm just going to go into edit mode. I'm going to position my 3D cursor right here, shift S, cursor to selection. And then we're just going to make the LED basically out of a very simple uh, UV sphere, which again, I'm going to do my little edit mode trick because I wasn't able to edit the number of vertices. I'm going to take this down to say eight and eight, keep it very simple, add in a subsurf modifier, make it nice and smooth, set the shading to be smooth. And then I'm going to rotate that 90 degrees, scale it way down. And this is going to be the bulb of the LED. So I'll pull that out to say right about there. And you can see that I didn't make this nearly deep enough. So I'll pull that back like that. Okay, so I'll scale this down just a little bit more. And so now I'm going to basically select this version, hit X, delete those vertices. Maybe I'll scale everything along everything but the Z axis, just to make it a little bit more of a light bulb shape, something like that. Okay. And then I'm basically going to cap the back of this. Um, we're not actually making a real uh, LED. We're simply going to get something that'll look kind of like one. So basically I want to uh, hit E extrude, right click, and then W merge at center. Just cap the back of that. And I'm actually going to hit Y to split that because that way this will be a different material than the rest of it. And then I'm also just going to add in a, a little, uh, uh, we'll just do a little cube. I'll scale it way down because this cube, then once it has a, you know, uh, with a subsurf applied, then it becomes a little bit of a circle or a s small ball. And since LEDs are, you know, it's a little wire, maybe I'll scale this out just a little bit to make it a little bit more of a capsule, make it a little bit more irregular. All right, cool. So that is going to be my light. And we are ready to begin setting up materials and lighting. Oh, actually, first I need to add a subsurf modifier to that. Make it nice and rounded. Perfect. All right. Uh, let's now start setting up our lighting and rendering. After I do one more thing, which is simply to add in a background plane like that. And like that. There we go. All right. So first things first, let's set up our camera. So I'm going to select the camera. I'm going to hit Alt-R and Alt-G, which just repositions repos it and resets the rotation to be right in the view. 
I'm going to rotate that 90 degrees. Since this is kind of an icon, so we're doing it almost like a 2D or a 3D version of a 2D thing, I'm going to make it straight on. And I'm going to set the render size to be square. We'll just do 800 by 800 and set the percentage to 100. Then also zoom this back in by hitting G and then Z twice to zoom or move along the local Z axis. All right. And if we now switch over to the cycles render engine and go to render view, it will start to render. But we really don't have very much to render at the moment because we don't have any lighting set up. So let's go ahead. We're going to delete the default lamp. I don't want it. And I'm first going to set up the key light by adding in another plane. I'm going to rotate that plane. I'm going to position it behind the camera about like this. This is going to be the primary light source that then is going to just illuminate like this. So on the materials then, let's go ahead and just create a new material. We're going to name this as key light. And this will be an emission type. And we're just going to set the, well, we're not going to set the strength just yet. Let's wait and see. Let's go to camera view and switch into rendered. Save our file. And okay, so that it's probably going to be a nice amount of illumination, but we'll kind of see how this works. Uh, let's now go and add in our second light, which the second light, I'm, oops, I'm just going to duplicate this one. I'm going to rotate it like this, and then I'm going to scale it along the local Y axis to make it just kind of a, a thin wide light like this. And on this one, I'm going to duplicate it, the material. So it's a new copy. And I'm going to call this the fill light. And this is the one that's going to kind of set the mood for the scene. So I'm going to set it to kind of a nice little, um, kind of a grayish blue, something like that. And on this one, I'm going to set the energy to maybe three. This one, the energy will be one. So now if I render this, we should get a little bit more progress. All right. Right now, you notice it looks really blown out, but we start to see a little bit of the color in there. So let's, before we adjust our, our light intensities, let's go ahead and set up the, the materials on our objects because uh, we won't really know how strong those lights are until we see them on the materials themselves. So first, let's work on the wood. So with the wood, I'm going to split my view, change this over to be a node editor and add in a new material. This new material is going to be the wood and we're going to go ahead and set the color to be a image texture. This image texture I've gotten from cgtextures.com and it's this wood find 0050 underscore five underscore S. Uh, you can just find it underneath the fine wood section. Uh, if we switch this into material view, we can see what this will look like, which right now looks like nothing material there we go right now it looks like nothing because we don't have any uvs so let's split our view again and this side we're going to switch into the uv image editor and if we select this texture go into edit mode you can see it's been loaded in there it is let's just on our view here since this is a square let's just hit u and unwrap and see what happens well it looks like that which actually if we look into the 3d view for this kind of model is going to be actually just fine so that actually will be totally fine. Um, I don't really want any seams along here because I'd like to be able to see that from an angle, but you really don't see hardly any distortion in here. Now this is a tileable pattern, so we could go ahead and set the vector for one is by defaults to UV, which is great. Um, but if we go ahead and put in say a, a vector mapping node that will connect that there, um, which I can then set the size right here to say be two, two and two, which will tell it to be tileable. But since I've added in the vector mapping node, as you can see replicated here, I also need to set in a UV node to be the input of that so that it actually connects cor correctly. And now we can see that tiled very nicely. Cool. All right. Um, I'm also going to set this to be a glossy, uh, or actually, no, not quite. If we render this, we can start to see what it's going to look like. And for one, we can start to check our lights on this. And our lights are probably just fine. You notice on the wood, they actually look pretty good. So let's go back to material view. And before doing much else, let's go ahead and set up some of our other planes, which is, let's see, this is our background plane. So we'll go ahead and name this as BG plane. I'm going to add a material to this. This again is going to be BG plane. And this is going to be a very soft glossy. 
So I'll set it maybe to 0.8 or so. I'm going to again give it kind of a grayish blue green of sorts. Maybe something kind of like, like that. Almost like a gray teal. Switch back into material view again. You can start to see that. All right, now let's go ahead. We'll select our LED. So we'll first, um, this, there's actually going to be several materials in here. There's going to be an LED glass for the outer and an LED inner or an actual LED. So this will be then LED. The inside LED is going to be an emission material. So if we now go into edit mode, we can select the inside part, click a sign on that. And we're going to give this a bright red, something like that. Oops. And we're going to set the intensity actually way up to like 30. Uh, then on the LED glass, which should be automatically assigned to that one, since that was the first material we added, we're going to again give it a kind of a red color. But then we're going to make this a glass shader. Uh, and we'll use the IOR of 1.45. That'll be fine uh, for glass. That's fairly typical. But since this is glass, we actually want it to ref refract well. So we actually need to add some thickness to this. So let's select this piece and we're going to hit spacebar, type in solidify, and that will just solidify that. We can then scale down the thickness maybe to be a bit thinner. There we go. So now that piece actually has thickness and will refract glass well. And then let's also maybe set reflective back on this. So we'll add in a new material and this will be LED back. And this is just going to be actually a dark, a kind of a black, dark gray. We just actually, we're not, we're not even going to set it to be reflective because it's so small. You're not really going to see it. That just kind of fills in that space to make it look a little better. All right. On this one, this is going to be our metal. So we'll add a new material. This is going to be metal. And we'll just start by giving this kind of a, blue, well, just a, a kind of a dark gray. But we're going to be doing a bit more with this. Let's just get our basic colors in first. Uh, this is also going to be the same metal, then, which we can go and hide that now. Then this one is going to have three materials again, or excuse me, two materials. That's going to be a, uh, a fabric, which is actually just going to be a very soft black. In fact, let's actually just call this soft black. And then another one, which is going to be shiny black. So this first soft black, we're going to make it a glossy. It's going to be really soft, so about like 0.8 or so. And we'll make it a really dark gray, about like that. Then the shiny black, we'll start by making it a glossy, although we're going to do a bit more with it. We'll make it very dark as well. And we're going to set the roughness to say 0.4. Now I know that that won't really be shiny at the moment, but it will when I'm done. So now in edit mode, let's select, say, this piece and this piece. Those are our shiny ones. We'll click assign, and then we can hit control I to flip our selection, and we'll assign our soft blacks. So now that should be all of our materials. So if we go into material mode again, we should be able to see all those. Fantastic. And if we switch into render view, we can see a bit more. Cool. Well, it's starting to work, but you know, these are maybe a little too black for one. We can't really see much of them yet. So we'll make those a little less black. Uh, and then I also want to start adding in some good shaders and such to really make this kind of pop a bit more. For one, on the LED, let's maybe make the emission to be a little bit more yellow, just to get a little bit more difference in there. I'm also going to set the strength to maybe 40. And I feel like, let's see, on the metal, let's go ahead and make this a glossy. So we're going to change it over to glossy. And we'll set the strength to maybe be like 0.1 or so. That'll make it fairly nice and strong. And that starts to actually feel pretty good as far as metal goes. Um, I don't, my key light I feel is a little too strong. I'm going to name that as key light. So let's change the strength down to maybe 1.5. There we go. We'll also take our fill light, which is this one. Fill light. Increase the strength maybe to 3. And let's also add in a world. So over the world buttons, we'll click Use Nodes. And we're going to make this maybe a little wider. And we'll increase the strength maybe to 2. That will just help kind of fill in some of the global illumination of sorts. You could actually add a sky texture here if you wanted, but that's not really going to fit with what we're doing. So let's just go back to a basic background. So we'll just click remove on that, and that goes back to a color. All right. So on the wood, 
what I want to do is to add in a nice reflective glow or uh, sheen to this. So uh, if I just say add in a shader and a glossy, we're going to make this a sharp shader. So it'll be really sharp. And if we were to connect this now, you would find that this is very reflective. Very, very reflective, which we really don't quite want. So let's cut that out. Uh, instead, we're going to add in a mix shader now. And we're going to combine these two together. So now you can see we've got control over basically which way we go. But you'll notice that when we go all the way to zero, this is just white and gray, not what we want. So let's just pull in our image texture here. So now we have a very glossy one that is colored by the same thing, but then gives us those nice highlights. So let's then set this to see like maybe like 0.4 or something like that will be a nice combination. And you'll also notice that this highlight's a little weird. So let's switch this view back over to 3D view. And I'm going to go into just shaded view. Then let's maybe take this plane and just kind of rotate it a little bit, maybe move it back until we start to get something that feels a little better. Maybe right in there. You can maybe bring this one down just a little bit more. Maybe something about like that. We could, if we wanted to get a little bit more dispersion in here, or not dispersion, but kind of different directions in the lights, we could actually subdivide this maybe twice, then pull this inside mesh out, and that would help actually project light in different directions, make it a little softer maybe. Or if you went the other direction, then you'd have light going like this, which actually looks really nice around that inside edge. So I'm actually going to do exactly that. Apologies, my voice is starting to get a little bit croaky. Okay, so that's starting to feel pretty good. Um, on the inside metal, or on the... the uh, bright plastic. Let's select it. And on the material then, let's see here's our shiny black and our soft black. Soft black, let's maybe take up a little bit so we can see it a little better through here. And then the shiny black, I'm going to do the same thing where I'm going to mix it with a sharp. So I'll do shader and, oops, I'm going to shader, mix shader. Pull that over there, drop that on. I'm going to duplicate this glossy, change this one over to a sharp combine those two, and then that will give me the ability to really kind of sharpen this up. So if I go all the way to zero, this should be nice and sharp. Or if I go all the way to one, uh, all the way to one makes it nice and sharp. And so that makes it super reflective. Maybe go to say 0.9 there. If we select say our mesh here, And you will notice that my machine's slowing down a fair bit while trying to render this. This is not the, the best machine for rendering out on cycles. But if we hide this, then you can start to see this a little better. And that will definitely lighten up and clear up a lot during the render time. Uh, but just right now, it's a little hard to see. So that starts to look fairly good. And I think maybe we're going to leave that exactly like it is. Um, I'm going to leave you for just a moment while this clears, or, uh, yeah, I'm going to leave you for just a moment while this clears up. So I'm just going to pause the, pause the render and then come back, uh, once that's nice and clean. And then we're going to jump right into some of the compositing. Alrighty. So I've got the, the actual thing rendered out now. Um, I haven't rendered it directly on this machine. I actually rendered it on another machine with my original file. And then what I did, uh, once you pull up the actual render, you can see that this one here um, is definitely still pretty noisy in like the LED and things like that. Um, and so just for the sake of time, I've gone ahead and used my original one to show you the compositing, but it's using the exact same method. So what I have is two separate images. Uh, if we see in here, and in the frames folder for the source files, you'll find a speaker icon.exr and a speaker icon LED mask. So the mask is nothing more than the actual LED right here, which I simply just duplicated, put onto another layer, so onto say layer two, and then uh, rendered it with, with cycles, 
by actually creating a shadeless material. So the shadeless material is actually pretty cool and easy thing to do where you can actually go in, you just set your, or first create a new LED or a new material. Let's just remove all these, we'll add a new material. This will be shadeless. We're gonna set it to be an emission and set the color to be 100% uh, white. But then rather than just do a basic emission, we're going to actually hit Shift A, add in a input and a light path, and then mix this. Whoops, we're going to mix this with a shader diffuse, also set to 100% white. And then with the light paths, we're gonna use this to actually mix these two materials. So we'll go shader and mix. We'll just combine these two like this, about like that. And then we're going to, rather than use the factor value, we're gonna use a light path, which basically light path tells Blender to only mix these based on a individual ray depending on how it's connected. So if, if the ray is coming from the camera, which is the one we're gonna use, is the camera ray, then it will see this. And I can't tell you why this works, but I will tell you that, that doing that gives you, uh, which I may have put these in reverse, like, ah, there we go. Putting them in that order gives you a perfect shadeless material of any color that you want like this. So. I can't tell you exactly why that works. Um, I'm sure that someone else could, but that's how it works and pretty cool. So that allows you to make a shadeless material, which then you go over here to the uh, render properties and underneath the, the film option, enable transparent, such that now when you render this layer, you can save this layer out with transparency by going to image, save as image, enable RGBA, and we're gonna change the save the format as open EXR. So then under frames, you can see we've got speaker icon and speaker icon LED mask. The LED mask is what's going to be used uh, for the actual, um, uh, for some of the compositing. So let's jump right into the compositing by just switching this view here, or excuse me, switching this over to the compositing nodes. We're going to enable use nodes and set the backdrop, and then we'll hit shift space just to maximize this. Now, rather than using the render layer, since I've saved out those frames, I can actually input those images. So image, open, go into frames, choose the speaker icon, and I can now use these images for my compositing. And this image contains the image and alpha value uh, and works really well for compositing. So then I'm gonna duplicate this and I'm going to change this one over to frames and LED mask. And in my experience, I found that actually compositing from images is generally much faster than compositing from a render layer because the render layer is stored directly in the memory, whereas the image is stored in a file. And so it doesn't have to continue using up your memory trying to read the render layers. Uh, I, that may not be completely accurate, but that's my, my experience. So now let's go ahead and we're at shift A. We're going to add in first a output and a viewer so that if we just control shift click on any one of these, we can then see it immediately in the 3D view. So with this render, here's the final render from my original file. Uh, what we want to do, and by the way, this original file um, is also included in the source files. And so um, if you find some discrepancies during the actual tutorial process, this is the actual one that is uh, finished and polished. Uh, what I wanna do is I want to, first of all, blur this out a little bit such that that's not just such a sharp circle. And then I want to add in a little glare here so you actually see that nice kind of uh, glow effect off of this light to make it really feel like it's turned on. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to actually blur this and we're actually gonna blur it twice so that we get a nice smooth blur. So I'm gonna first hit Shift A, add in a filter and a blur. And we're going to just go ahead and feed this image output directly into it like that. We're gonna set this to be a Gaussian or fast Gaussian blur will be fine, it's a little quicker. And we're gonna set the blur amount to be, let's just try 10. And you'll see that blurs everything, but we don't wanna blur everything. We wanna actually only blur the LED. So we're gonna pull in the image value from here, which normally you would want this to be a grayscale value, but since that's 100% shadeless white, we don't need to worry about converting it to a grayscale. So we'll just pull that right in to be the size. And now that's only going to blur based around that. Although it does seem that that didn't quite work. Uh, and as to why that doesn't work in this case, I actually don't know. Um, it's actually a little interesting, but just now, well, 
testing, I actually paused the recording for just a moment, and it turns out that this does not work with the fast Gaussian. And that may just be a result of fast Gaussian being strictly, you know, since it's faster, it's more limited. But if you switch this right, right over to a Gaussian blur, then you'll see that blurs out just nicely. Maybe set that to 10. That makes it a little bit more limited. And then I'm going to duplicate this again. I'm going to feed in the same points, just like this. But this time I'm only going to blur this maybe five along each axis. And now we can see it's a much smaller blur because now I'm going to go ahead and hit Shift A, add in a color and a mix. And we're going to combine these two images, say like this and like this. And then we're going to combine them. If you look at this, you know, you're not going to see a whole lot. Uh, if you switch the, the angles around, you'll see this is blurred now on top. This one's not. Um, but if we go ahead and now set, to, set this to add, it's going to combine them and make that a nice soft glow. But at the same time, it's added everything else, which we don't necessarily want. So yet again, we're going to pull this image in to right there. And that way it'll only add this piece here. Now you notice that that makes it look kind of nasty and blown out, which maybe is not quite what we want. But if you just bear with it for a second and let the glare take its effect first, you'll find you probably won't even notice that. So if we now hit Shift A, add in a filter and a glare, we'll drop that right onto there. And by default, it's set to streaks, which gives you this, which you may or may not want. In this case, I don't really want. So I'm going to, well, maybe. First, I'm going to set it to be simply a fog glow, which gives me just a little bit of glow right around there. You can see if we switch between these two, no glow. A little bit of glow just helps kind of light things up. If we turn the threshold down a little bit, we can get a little bit more glow. The threshold basically determines how bright do pixels need to be in order to be added to the glow. And this means, you know, 0.8, um, where one would be white. Uh, we can adjust the size of this. So we can increase the size. If you're having trouble seeing exactly what's being affected, if you set the mix all the way to one, that will show only the glow and not any of the original image. Set it to zero or negative one, it shows only the image, where then a mix of zero shows a 50-50 mix of both. Uh, we could go ahead and increase the quality to high on this. It'll take a little bit longer, but it'll be good to have that extra quality. And then I'm going to duplicate this glow again, and this time I'm going to add in those little bits of streaks. So we'll add in streaks, and we can see what it'll do here in a moment. And actually, you know, during this, we ought to set this to low and this to low just to speed it up. So these streaks are then really strong. I'm going to fade it out or make the fade a lot smaller. I'm going to increase the number of streaks to maybe nine or so. So we get a full circle there. And then let's go ahead, turn the color modulation down just a little bit. And now let's go and set this back to high. And you notice that that's way too strong, but generally... Um, the lower values tend to have a much stronger effect, or this is set to low versus high, much stronger effect, and then high is much higher quality and is not quite as drastic generally. So you want to be sure that you're not, you know, there you can see how that's definitely changed a lot. So you want to be sure that you're not deciding your effect based strictly on the low value. We could set that down, you know, maybe tone it down a little bit by decreasing the, the, the mix and maybe turn the mix down or the fade down just a little bit more. Maybe that's a little bit too strong. There we go. That looks a little better, maybe a little bit less even. And we could try adding in one more glow with a, um, a ghost in here. Sometimes those can add a fairly cool little effect, but mostly going to be personal preference as far as what you want within your render. So, you know, the ghost gives you that kind of effect. If you turn the iterations down, you can make it a little less. Turn the mix down to, you know, negative something there. Increase the threshold a bit and turn down the color modulation. And you can, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want. Personally, I think this is a little overkill for this. I'm not a big fan, so I'm going to leave it exactly like it was with something like, as soon as it comes back, something like this in just a moment. There we go, my beautiful arrow. Cool, so there you go. So that's that, basically. Uh, we could now go in and you know do some basic color correction using, say, an RGB curves, drop that on there, do a little bit of tweaking to 
push uh, the, the image a little further. For this kind of tweaking, personally, I prefer to do this in, say, Photoshop, Pixelmator, or the GIMP, uh, just because I, I think it's a little bit faster. Um, at least on, on this machine, it's not particularly speedy anymore. It's starting to show its age, unfortunately. It's getting tired. Uh, and so some of the compositing I like to do more in Photoshop or something like that, just because it's a little bit quicker. But, but you can most definitely do it right here. But I find this kind of stuff to be much easier to do in Blender than in, say, uh, the GIMP or, or, or Photoshop. So there you have it. That is creating the 3D speaker icon. Um, it was a really fun little project, so I hope you guys have enjoyed seeing the process a little bit. Again, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to leave them in the comments or send a support ticket to support at cgcookie.com. Again, I do request or ask that the support tickets be tutorial related just because we tend to get quite a few of them, uh, which is great. Uh, but there's only so many that we can answer between the few of us that there are. Uh, and also, if you, again, had any questions or problems throughout the tutorial, uh, if you download the source files as a citizen member, you can go ahead and dissect the file, dig through it, do anything that you want, and see what, see what you've got. So, there you have it. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time.